Bush, thank you very much for the opportunity to be able to be here. And I am truly honored. I, I think um, you are on the leading edge of education training and healthcare professional development. Uh, this is an area we have ignored too long and been ostriches. And so uh, I commend you uh, for what I perceive as an extraordinarily difficult task. A few things that I will be saying uh, during my talk will reflect my military background and the amount of time that I've spent in the military, 23 years. How, how many of you are military, have served in our military? And how many of you have used simulation or training during either your military or non-military? So there are a few out here. So this is, uh, for the majority, it appears that this is going to be um, a relatively new experience compared to those who've had lifelong training through simulation. Uh, I'd like to begin my lecture in reverse. By that, I mean I'm going to answer some questions that you were either asking directly or hadn't asked, because some of them are contained within my talk, but many of them are not. And these are basically sound bites. Uh, but I think that as I listened to the previous lectures, that uh, there are important uh, things that I don't want to leave out of my talk. Uh, simulation, uh, its most profound effect is it gives us permission to fail. Today, if we fail, our patients die. Simulation, we fail and nobody dies. That's a key issue here. Second of all, uh, it brings to the table two things that we truly have never had before. One, objective, quantitative measurements of performance. Our cognitive skills do not give us performance measures. They just give us our knowledge base. Some of our oral examinations provide that for us. But OSCE, OSCE is simulation, provides that, as well as the mannequin base and so forth. I'll talk about those. Why is this important? Because up until now, we have not trained to competence. We have trained to opportunity, what comes in the door. We have trained uh, to time. You get X amount of time, and at the end, you get a grade. How many of you flew here today? All right. And how many think that their pilots went through simulation training and were able to trust them? Right. What was their score on this simulation before they were allowed to get in that cockpit? 100%. They trained to confidence. They did not leave that until they passed everything without an error. We train today, for example, I did a simulation the other day, and I got 85%. Now, what I should have done when I saw my patient the next morning was say, Mrs. Jones, I'm going to do this operation onto you. And, you know, I passed yesterday. I got 85%. I'm only going to make 15% mistakes on you. That's standard of practice. Why do we allow that to happen? Because we've not embraced simulation. It's all about ensuring the quality of performance and competency. Uh, I will repeatedly talk about uh, simulation is actually the core of evidence-based medicine. Because we go to competence, because we can quantify and measure, it can be evidence-based. And we're just beginning in healthcare to get into evidence-based medicine. I saw the other day that only 10% of publications meet Cochrane Level 1 of evidence-based medicine. Very, very few of the publications that we have have gotten the level of evidence that we have in other industries. Uh, training and assessment are two sides of exactly the same coin. And if you don't do training and assess simultaneously, you've lost the major value. Types of assessment are formative and summative. While you're training, if an error occurs and you correct it in initially and instantly, that is formative. It happens when the error occurs and you correct the error. Summative, on the other hand, is you allow them to go all the way through the end, and then you go back and you tell them what their errors are, and they allow to, to repeat that. So there, there are a number of different areas that are involved in that. Uh, one of the values, and I will probably emphasize this again, but one of the greatest values of simulation was in a question asked earlier, uh, 
and that was we don't have enough time. There is a decreasing exposure to patients. We have to take what comes in the door. What simulation and in other industries, and we have the opportunity to do as well, will allow us to provide not only the basic competencies, but a variety of different scenarios on exactly the same issue. So that when an individual is trained, they will have the opportunity to not only see this patient in an OSCE that has diabetes, but previously there will be a digital library of virtual patients with 36 different variations of diabetes and they will be able to go over those and get a larger breadth of knowledge. They will get higher up on the Dreyfus Pyramid, which is from novice to competent to proficient to expert to master. What makes the difference between the expert and the master and those who are proficient in competence is not their technical or their knowledge skill. It's the wide variety of exposures to variation that makes them in the level of master or competent. So digital libraries or mannequin-based libraries are going to be, I believe, one of the most important components as we move forward. This is what is done in other areas. A digital library, for example, for a pilot would simply be, yes, we have to do an emergency landing, landing on the Hudson, landing on the uh, desert, landing in the mountainside or whatever. The variations of these is what's the key issue. Yes, you have to have the basic competent skills, but to become really proficient in masters, you have to have the variety. And we've done that in the past by what comes in the door, whether that be the clinic, or it be in the operating room, or it be in the emergency room. It's what comes in the door, and that's our variety of experience. Uh, another very interesting thing that was brought to our attention before is that we are focusing most of our simulation and training at this point in time on procedural skills and in the residency level. The trend today now is moving from the residency level, particularly R1 and our intern level. We are bringing the same curriculum now that they've been validated down to the medical school. And we're even getting high schools involved in this because this helps them decide whether or not they want to go, for example, into medicine. Um, I've heard a lot about high fidelity. I, I think that high fidelity is important, but that's not the key. The key is matching the fidelity to the level of the task that you want to train. It does me no good to get a high fidelity mannequin to teach somebody to tie a knot. I do not need a virtual reality simulator to tie a knot. It's not cost effective. A lot of our problems that we have today is when people think of simulators, they think of the aviation simulators. And they expect to use the highest fidelity possible for even the simplest of tasks. So matching the task to the fidelity, I think, is a key issue. How much does a flight simulator cost for a commercial airline or, a, say, a high-performance jet? Does anybody have an idea? Try $15 million. Do we, have, do we have any $15 million medical simulators? We're complaining about 250000 at the highest fidelity mannequin we've got available. Nobody complains about $15 million. Why is that? Where is our commitment to our patient? Is the death of a single patient any worse than a crash in an aircraft? I would think not. One of the problems is we don't have a good business model. We can't make money in education and training. There's no sponsorship, there's no DOD to put money into it, and the amount of money they're putting into it is pittance, absolute pittance. They were all enthusiastic about the new $35 million a year program that got put into place for medical simulation in the military. PEO STRI is in the Army, that's Program Executive Office for Simulation Training. In the Army not the Department of Defense. The, the Department of Defense is about $13.5 billion for training, but it's only $8 billion for the Army. PEO STRI is the training command for the Army, using only simulation. Their annual budget, $3.2 billion for simulation alone. Put all three services together, it's $5.5 billion only for simulation, $13.5 billion for all of their training. What's wrong with this picture? 
and there are as many or more people in the, in the healthcare profession that need training. There are about 600,000 people involved in healthcare professional training that need to be trained every year. So those are some background uh, things that I uh, uh, wanted to make sure that I, I got off my chest before we got started. So now we will rush through this thing, and, and uh, because I unfortunately. So this is my financial disclosure. We're all required to do that uh, to the uh, thing of transparency. Don't you just hate it? I'm giving this high-tech lecture, and I can't get the technology to work. I'm pressing the foot. There we go. Uh, this is me doing my maintenance of certification uh, a short time ago. All right. We need to change this, if you will. Here is technology-driven, procedure-driven training. Now, this is uh, called Brickies in Bangladesh, and it's how would you develop a curriculum to train this individual to carry those bricks from that wobbly boat down to wherever the construction site would be? Oh, and how are you going to teach them about errors? So think about this as we go through the lecture on this is a very simple task, carrying bricks, but how would you develop the type of curriculum in order to teach this individual how to do that? You know, they did it by our standard method. They're using our standards. See one, do one, teach one. That's how it was done. So with that prelude, this is a revolution. The last time there was a revolution in medical education was the Flexner Report in 1908. Education, medical education and healthcare, is actually moving in 100-year cycles. If we do not get it right now, it's going to be 100 years before we're going to have another fundamental revolution in medical education. What is the main problem, in my mind, with medical education today? The answer is silos. Everybody does their own training, whether it be the internists train in hematology one way, and the hematologists train in another way, and the oncologists train in a completely different way. They all train the same thing, but they have their own curriculum developed by their own people that haven't talked with anybody else before, and they are the only way that do it right. No wonder our educational system and our physicians are confused and having difficulty. Most physicians don't do the same things the same way because there's no common curriculum, if you will. So breaking down the silos is going to be an important issue to that. To that end, uh, we have been working with the American College of Surgeons and 14 surgical specialties to create the Alliance for Surgical Specialties in Education and Training to develop a common curriculum. And as our pilot study, we're using robotic surgery because all of these specialties have no curriculum in this area. And rather than everybody develop their own, we're going to put it together. It's a very exciting experiment, and I'll show you some uh, uh, processes that we're using on that. But, but right now, if we don't get it right, the urologist and the gynecologist and the colorectal surgeon and the general surgeon will do exactly the same procedure differently. Why is that? We shouldn't have that. And why is it that I get trained one way in the United States and they get completely different trained in Australia or in England. I mean, are our patients all that different? So there are, should be some commonality. It doesn't mean that we have to have rigid standards, flexibility, or as the military says, interoperability is what the key issue is here. This is the focus in the revolution. Before, the focus was the doctor or the nurse. Now the focus of education has focused properly on the patient. It's about patient safety. And by improving medical education, and particularly procedural one, we will improve safety. It's not about the doctor or the nurse anymore. It's about patient safety. That's the focus here. We were fortunate for ACGME to come forward and redefine what competency is. And interestingly enough, when I saw this, I went ballistic. I said, these people have no idea what the hell they're talking about. We have no curricula that have anything to do with professionalism. We have no standards that we can match to them. And what is this practice-based learning stuff? But in their wisdom, much beyond my wisdom, of course, they were able to look at this much more impartially than I did. 
And I think that we have an opportunity in each of these fields. It's going to be very difficult in knowledge, but in all the rest of them, simulation is going to play a major role, if you will. Two components of the revolution, as I mentioned, are objective training of technical skills. We have simulators and we have the, the, the curriculum, which is the, the process that's available to. And the key issue here, as I mentioned before, is we can objectively measure. And second of all, we can set criterion. I'll show you how they're set in order to be able to ensure that when a person passes, that their grade is 100%. It's not 80% or 60% or whatever. So the touchstone is applying objective metrics and competency bench training. That's what simulation brings that's not been available to us before. How do you set a benchmark? This has been done in other industries, and it's been based upon behavioral psychology, and I'm going to walk you quickly through this. This is how the standard way of setting a benchmark is. What happens is that you get experienced or expert surgeons to, to do whatever your curriculum uh, simulation is, and I'll get to that in a minute. <clears throat> it has been defined as two consecutive trials without improvement. This is what is called the learning curve, and when you get to a certain level and you don't show any more improvement, that is the level, theoretically, of your level of competence and proficiency. <clears throat> and then what you do is that you take the mean of your experts or your experienced physicians, and then you, you calculate what their mean is and see what their standard deviation, and then you set their, this is um, what has been by consensus accepted as what the benchmark would be. It's one standard deviation below the mean. This is what we have used uh, and what we use in simulation, in aviation, in nuclear power industry, is this is the level that we train to. We can measure that level accurately. We can set that level. And that is level of competence. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, proficient, nor does it mean that you're uh, an expert or a master. It simply means that you're competent. So that is a process that's about 50 years old that has been validated repeatedly in non-healthcare industries. Uh, at the moment, this is a, a method that we're, we're moving forward towards. So we can actually set that competence level, and then an individual, when they train, they train up their learning curve until they get two consecutive trials that have met the metrics, that you will, without errors, and then we can certify that they're competent. So we also need to make sure that we do validation, and these are just the validation methodologies that have been standardized in the past uh, in other industries, phase, content, concert, and so forth. In addition to that, we need to make sure that we can include in our validation those about things such as errors, inter-rate reliability uh, for observational ones, whether or not it's practical, many of the times that we develop a curriculum and we want a simulator for it, what ends up happening, it's not practical to be able to introduce that into the curriculum and whether or not it's usable. We can do quantitative measures. For example, there is this process here. Uh, this has now been commercialized as a, uh, as a product called the EDGE, E-D-G-E. And basically, <clears throat> it's a robotic system that you insert your instrument in and accurately tracks the measures of your hand motions. You end up with something called a motion signature. Uh, on the left, you see the novice trying to tie a laparoscopic knot. And down at the right, you can see what an expert does when they try to tie a knot. Not only visually can you instantly tell the difference between them, but it reflects exactly what's happening. The novice is kind of flailing around where we see very precise motions with the experts. But the beauty of this that the system that does these measurements measures them quantitatively in millimeters, in angles of velocity, in, in uh, speed, it, all kinds of measurements. We can quantify the performance of the hands, and then we can compare the performance of the individual to the performance of the expert, but we can give feedback. It's not like, well, your hands are moving way too much. Your left hand is moving four or five centimeters when it should only be moving one or two centimeters, and your right hand, and so forth. So the idea is not only can we assess what their performance is, but we can feed back to them and improve their training in a more quantitative and measured method. We do have mandates. In uh, July of 2008, the Residency Review Committee in, uh, in Surgery required that all training programs must have access to a simulation center or you are on probation. And the following year, you will be reviewed. And if you do not have access in our training using simulation, you will lose your program. 
So one of the reasons is the impetus of the certifying authorities are saying, you will do simulation or you will not. Without this mandate, we were flailing. We were absolutely flailing. And I think that this, plus the following year when the American Board of Surgery accepted the certification of, the fund of completing fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery, a very simple skills-based thing, you have to have the certificate that said that you, were, you have passed the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery, a skills-based training system, or your application to become a board-certified surgeon is returned as incomplete. It doesn't matter how long you've trained, you may never become a board-certified surgeon until you have this certificate that says, I have passed the fundamentals of laparoscopic surgery. You can't even sit your exams. And once again, another great impetus as we go forward. We are seeing specialty societies, at least the ones I'm familiar with in surgery, are beginning to move in this direction. Developing standards and then setting these standards on uh, procedural based training. It's not the simulator. The simulator is a tool. You are absolutely right. There are hundreds of tools. Simulation is not the tool. I mean, not, not anything more than the tool. It's all about the curriculum. And I'll be talking more and more about the curriculum. There are actually now, I believe, two different uses for curriculum. Our initial training, and there's a list of the things that we do. Um, new procedures. You know, we don't really do a very good job when a new technology comes by in training people. Whether you know it or not, every one of your pilots are trained on that aircraft. They may only fly the aircraft that they are trained on, and they have passed their simulation with 100%. I can do 23 different surgical operations on the stomach. I may have only done three or four or five during my residency program, but I can do any of them. We are not at a level at this point in time of procedure-specific competence. And just because I do one operation does not necessarily mean I'm competent in doing another one. The other is retraining, maintenance of certification. This is a lot of what you're involved with, uh, administrative leave and so forth. And the military has a very specific one on redeployment. Colonel Rob Rush published a paper uh, out of Madigan of the returning physicians from the battlefield. If you are in a related specialty to what you do out on the battlefield, you know, trauma surgery, intensivist, and so on and so forth, it takes you about three months before you're actually back to the level of competence that you had before. However, if you are out of your specialty, if you're a pediatrician, you're doing amputations and eviscerations, which is what we see in many of our uh, soldiers out there, and now you have to come back and do, say, a pediatric cardiac cath, it's going to take you six months or more. So there is a real relearning curve, if you will, once you've been away and back, and the civilian counterparts have been listed here. So more and more, retraining is becoming a very important issue, along with maintenance of certification. We have four customers. If you're going to develop a curriculum, actually there are four people you need to get involved with developing the curriculum and, and setting up at the beginning, which I'll mention in a moment. Uh, you want either the department chair the, or, or the residency program director or somebody who is planning a curriculum. And then you want the faculty who has to teach it. That's the actual user of the curriculum. And the end user, if you will, is the student. We've never asked a student to participate in, in helping develop a curriculum. And probably the most important part is the licensing authority, the certifier. When I was at DARPA, I spent somewhere between 40 and $50 million developing at least 12 different simulators, funding them, if you will, your tax dollars. Zero have been approved by any certifying body. Not a single one that have been. Why? Because I got the best expert, and we had one of the finest engineers in the company with a great business model. And they went ahead and they developed it. They did a, a phenomenal validation study unequivocally that we were able to show that it was demonstrated in, that if you use the simulator, you actually improve. You can operate faster and so forth. And we presented this to the boards, and you know what they said? You've got the wrong outcomes measures. We can care less on how fast you operate. 
Why, why do we care? Why are you measuring time? Because we could, and because the experts that we employed, I'm the fastest surgeon in town. That's how they judged their performance. They didn't look at them. So getting the certifying authorities as you develop your curriculum involved is an absolute key issue in my mind. The other one, we have to begin teaching mistakes. Has anybody been teaching anybody mistakes before? Great. You're, you're on the leading edge. Uh, you're only you know, 50 years uh, behind most of the other areas where most other people are 80 years behind. All right. The point being is that this is what all of our simulations today in non-healthcare industries are about. It's about the mistakes. They challenge you what happens when hydraulics fail when you're trying to do a landing. What happens if you have an engine out and you have to land on the Hudson? Those are mistakes or errors. We don't do that. We're only trying to teach the people the right thing. I can recall we were doing a validation study on one of them. Uh, very simple task, very simple task. And I noticed that the individual was making exactly the same mistake repeatedly. And, uh, um, Joan, you know, that's the fourth time that you, you, you tried to get past this and you made the same mistake. She turned back at me very irate and said, what mistake? You never told me that was wrong. You've been so busy telling me what the right thing is that I, how am I supposed to know what's wrong? How am I going to be able to recognize an error, avoid an error, if I don't know what the error is? So we've not been including in our educational process errors. That is what our certifying bodies are all about. That's what patient safety is about. It's about avoiding errors, not being the fastest surgeon in town or the slickest endovascular catheter person. It's about not making mistakes. And we've totally avoided that in our curriculum development. All right. It doesn't like me. Great. So what have we learned? Once again, it's all about the curriculum. We started back in the 1987-203 time frame. I, I built one of the earliest virtual reality simulators before I went to DARPA. <clears throat> and we was all about the simulator. And we got a bunch of engineers and built the simulator. And we worked with industry and academia. Well, and this is kind of along what we learned and are applying to fundamentals of robotic surgery that we're developing now. Then, in 2003, Dr. Satch Deva, the director of, medical, uh, of surgical education at the American College of Surgeons, said on the podium, to me, it's not about the simulator, stupid. It's all about the curriculum. And so beginning in 2003, the aha moment was, hmm, you're absolutely right. The simulator is a tool, and it's the curriculum that's key. And so we began doing curriculum development, and we involved some of the societies to start developing because they were important with the initial simulation, if you will, the assessment tools. <clears throat> and we also did validation studies to guarantee the quality of them. And we had other individual people using standard validation templates as well as getting the societies involved in that. And then we asked them to be certified, and all your boards said wrong answer, as I mentioned before. And why? Because we hadn't done high-stakes testing and evaluation. So high-stakes testing and evaluation has to be part of where you're going. You need to have exactly the same outcomes measures during your testing and evaluation uh, for high-stakes that you have when you're doing your training and assessment. You want them to be able to train and be assessed to a level of competency, hopefully 100%, before they take their high-stakes testing and evaluation. And then, as I mentioned before, this is all entirely dependent upon the outcomes measures. This is what we call the full life cycle development of a curriculum. Once the needs assessment has been done, I haven't added that because this is just the curriculum development report. You've got to make sure that you, you are training the right thing that has been required. So that needs assessment or the requirements uh, that the military talks about comes first. But once you say this is what we have to train, you have to set the outcomes measures first. Because if you don't, when it comes time to do your assessment and your testing, you will be, as we have learned, testing for the wrong thing. But probably even more important than that is that you need to get feedback from the certifiers. For example, from the, the Board of Surgery, we're getting feedback from them on the number of people that have not passed. And the ones that haven't passed, why not? So we can change our curriculum and we can improve the curriculum so that it will actually be able to train the people with the metrics that we want to do. 
The board is not in the, the business of failing people. They would, there was nothing they would like more than having a 100% pass rate. And so they don't want to fail people, but if you don't meet levels of competence, then you're going to have to fail. And the more they feed back to you, those who develop the curriculum, the better the curriculum will be and the safer our physicians will be for our patients. So that's kind of the background on curriculum development and why it's so important. We're doing the fundamentals of robotic surgery, as I mentioned, across 14 specialties that are using robotics today. Once we have this and we were developing a curriculum template that the asset committee, the 14 specialties, have developed for doing procedural curriculum. And then we, are, we have got buy-in from each of the, fund, uh, of the uh, societies that they will develop their own specialty-specific fundamentals because we're just teaching them how to use the robot, how to use the instruments, how to set it up, how to do communication before, during, and after the procedure. That's what's part of the fundamentals, regardless of what operation or specialty you're in. There are specialty-specific fundamentals. For example, the urologists don't use clips, but the uh, gynecologists do. So the urologists don't think that's part of the fundamentals for as far as they're concerned, but the but the gynecologists do. So at the individual level, individual specialty level, they'll have to do their own specific individuals. And then as you see, if you use the same template for developing a curriculum, then you can begin uh, comparing, if you will, across specialties. If people do the same kind of training, if I'm going to do uh, mobilizing the colon for colorectal versus uh, his, uh, urology versus uh, uh, gynecology, at least we'll have a common template and common ways of teaching so that when we, we look at this across the template, we'll be able to see them. The scope of simulation, now uh, I'll dash through this one here because I am getting a little bit behind on time here and I'm having a lot of fun. Uh, the technology is not the issue, if you will. We have plenty of technology out there, all kinds of technology. In healthcare, we, most of it's been imported from the others. There, there's no sin in going to other specialties, other disciplines, and asking them, uh, what do you do, and importing and adapting what they have rather than trying to reinvent the wheel. So up until recently, there have been three ways that all of industry has looked at simulation. Virtual, computer-based, all the way to virtual reality, uh, including Internet. Live, which is using models or using mannequins. Physical objects that you actually do, including patients as well for OSCEs. And something called constructive. And constructive um, are your, for example, disaster planning, the scenario planning, where you've got multiple individuals from multiple disciplines working together. And your, your team training kind of bridges between live and constructive, if you will. There is a new area that's recently been recognized, and that is video games. Video games are becoming a really important part. They're called serious games or educational games, and there are literally dozens, if not hundreds, of conferences on serious games today for educational processes. We, at least the military, is beginning to look into them as methods of being able to do it. And it's not about the game. It's about the, the motivation that goes along with the games, how you can engage your people, have built a simulation based upon the principles of gaming that will allow you to get them more engaged to retain their, their uh, education better and so forth. So these are now the four areas that other industries are looking at as the four pillars, if you will, of simulation and training. Um, I'm sorry, I have nothing other than this clicker, and this is the only thing that moves forward. So, uh, We also have the methodology and the processes, uh, OSATs, uh, observational one with checklist that has an observation. This was, uh, Richard Resnick did this a while ago, and this is a kickoff of our objective assessment tools, toolkits that we now have available, if you will. Interesting thing about this is that the original study was done with, uh, over a two-day period of time, with 46 students, <clears throat> eight hours a day for two con consecutive days, each student had one full-time faculty watching them. So we had 23 faculty for two complete days watching uh, 46 students. Is this a viable model? I mean, I can't get a faculty member to do an hour of simulation and training 
because he's pushed so hard for those RVUs and getting his clinical practice to pay off stuff. To get a faculty member out to train is enormously difficult, enormously difficult. Uh, the constraints on their time now is getting worse and worse. The nurses are a little bit better. They can put time aside, but the physicians are very big. The Achilles heel of simulation and training for healthcare, for medical personnel is the faculty member. That's the number one reason that we can't do as much training as we need. So Gary Dunnington from the University of Illinois came up with the concept of a coach, a simulation coach in which the faculty member train specifically a coach to do particularly lower level skills to get them through the initial training and assessment and then final assessment and then testing would be done by faculty members reducing the amount of time required for them to be there very very important concept if you will so we have we have the processes we know how to do this we know how to measure accurately which is really a key issue we've got simulators and you'll see a number of them here and <clears throat> We have clinical application of this. Simulation isn't only in the laboratory, if you will, but it also needs to move out into the real world. Preoperative warm-up. How many of you are surgeons or have been surgeons? Yeah. Have any of you warmed up before your operation? Have you gone to a, a baseball game? Perfect. No. Have been gone to a baseball game? Have you ever seen a batter dash out of the uh, dugout and immediately start going? Have you seen any tennis player not serve a number of volleys before they begin? Have you gone to a symphony and seen everybody rush out and start playing instantly? No, that doesn't happen. Is my patient's life any less valuable than these professionals? Aren't I a professional? Why am I not warming up? We did a number of studies and we showed unequivocally that if you warm up in an ob objective task for only 10 to 15 minutes, that is not operation specific, that you're able to improve both your cognitive as well as your psychomotor skills. Decreasing, our measurement was errors. It was not time. Decreasing errors. We did decrease time as well, but we decreased errors. So there is merit to it. And a functional MRI study shows that what you do under this specific particular type of task is you activate specific centers, particularly near-term near uh, memory as well as your um, attention level. And so warming up actually cognitively as well as psychomotor is able to improve in performance. So whether or not this becomes uh, relatively standard is, is yet to, to come forward. And there's a little portable simulator uh, built with Radio Shack for like $300 that can be done. Um, surgical rehearsal. This is going to be the epitome of simulation and training. Importing an individual's specific anatomy as is done on the endovascular simulators today, if you will. And actually, immediately before the operation, practicing that procedure, making the mistakes on the simulator so that when you operate shortly after or perhaps the next day, that you will have made those mistakes and you will choose the right tools, the right catheters, if you will, and hopefully you will not make the same mistake on the patient that you did on the previous day simulator. This, in my mind, is what our pilots do. They fly into a specific airport. Not only do they do errors, but they have to fly into every single airport that they fly into. If they haven't done, say, uh, Chicago O'Hare on, on the simulator, they can't fly into Chicago. They have to fly into Chicago repeatedly, land without crashing, go through the, all the air traffic control, do all their taxing stuff. They have to do that on the simulator for Chicago and then if they go to Denver, then they're going to have to come to Denver and do it. Patient-specific, if you will. Mission rehearsal is what it's called. And military does it. Nuclear industry does it. Aviation does it. And we don't. And as I mentioned, we have an endovascular simulator. I believe there may even be one here that you'll be able to see that can import three-dimensional CT, MR, angiograms in there and be able to actually rehearse the procedure. That is the end game in my mind. That's how you reduce errors. Sure, you can generically make them a better technician and improve their cognition, but nothing substitutes for the actual image of the individual. And we're also looking at other areas, uh, new ideas, uh, virtual worlds. Many of our simulation centers have virtual representations of them. Um, it's still quite awkward, but uh, we have some of our students are actually 
saving themselves their 80 hour work week by going home and coming back into the virtual uh, simulation center and practicing their skills from home, if you will. That doesn't count against their 80 hours. I never figured out why if my student comes in and goes to the simulation lab, that counts against their 80 hours. But if they come in and they go to the library, that doesn't count against them. Why is that? Isn't simulation every bit as important as the library function? So we're trying to move this out. I, I have a lot of heartburn <laughs> because I'm an older generation surgeon with this 80-hour limitation. In, government imposed regulation of the way I'm allowed to practice medicine uh, ver with, through what I would perceive as a very spurious argument that they made. And so the message is we have a new methodology, a new technology to enhance our curriculum and rethink the way that we're going. Maintenance of certification is an opportunity. It's not a concern that we have now. And by leveraging off of skills training, whether it be through the internet or a simulator or whatever method you want to use, will allow us to do that. And that's why it's a revolution. It's all the way from basic skills all the way through continuity of care. One of the uh, very interesting and I think one of the most uh, impressive areas that I have seen was the area of in situ training. How many are familiar with in situ training? Yeah. Well, um, one of the early pioneers happens to have been Brian Ross from University of Washington. And he, what he did is he snuck the mannequin into the intensive care unit and called a code. All right? And all of a sudden, the code team shows up and said, what is this? You called me here, and there's not even a patient? To which Brian said, I did. If you don't save this patient, you're off the team. Whoa. All of a sudden, they got serious about this. And they went through it, and uh, they were going along. They were doing well. And all of a sudden, he started going towards uh, VTAC, and then <clears throat> near asystole, and he called for epinephrine, took it, injected it, and he flatlined. He just killed the patient. He's off the team. He looked at this as, this is epinephrine one in a thousand, not one in 10,000. I did everything exactly right. Why did you hand me? He's in charge, but now he's off the team. All right. It was not a surgeon problem. It was a system issue. How did that ever get on the cart in the first place? You know, did the nurse check it? Did the pharmacy send the one? We have no idea. So inside to training is very, very valuable. It allows us to identify errors that occur at the system level as opposed to the individual level. And we are moving this into many areas, OB suites and um, uh, emergency rooms and so on and so forth. So I believe that inside to training is going to be a very, very valuable component of what we're going. So, but anyhow, that is, uh, I think, uh, pretty much the, the end of the lecture. Those are the type of things that uh, are of importance to me. Uh, I think when you're looking at remediation, the tools that we have provided, I think, are going to make remediation from an objective standpoint a lot easier than what we have done before. I'm very concerned about subjectivity when it comes to being able to assess people, whether it be first time or for, re or for the maintenance of certification or for rem remediation. We need to become more quantitative. And so I leave you with that final thought. Thank you. Thank you.